Welcome back, AP Calc AB students. And might I say, you guys are killing it. Great job getting through the first four videos, uh, first three videos, I should say, with the first four examples with topic seven, six, and seven, seven. This is our finale. This is our last one before we really embark on our final topic for AB calculus, and that's applying these differential equations to real world settings. But before we do that, let's take a look at one final differential equation. It really doesn't have a lot of complex components to it, like a couple of our last equations did. It's just that it's presented a little bit differently, and I wanted to uh, check and see how you might all react to that. So let's read it together. It says, find the equation of the curve that passes through the point 1, 3 and has a slope of y over x squared at any point x, y. And be sure to state the domain of your solution equation. Well, it doesn't probably read like the traditional differential equation, but the idea that we're finding the equation of a curve is the solution idea. The point one three is our initial condition. And the idea slope is y over x squared is the same as derivative is y over x squared. And that is our differential equation. And I would like to go ahead and start right there. We'll just replace the word slope with dy over dx. By golly, you guys have done that all year long. And so here it is, there's our differential equation. And as it turns out that this one's going to be probably a little bit easier to solve for. So we're going to divide the y over to separate and we're going to multiply the dx over. And so we have something that looks a bit like that. So by and large, much easier to separate than some of the things that we've seen as of late. Next up, you're going to want to put your integration symbols in front of both sides. And then we start thinking about how we want to integrate this. Oops, that should be a dx there. So the antiderivative of 1 over y, this is not the first time we've seen this in this particular topic. That's going to be the natural log of the absolute value of y. And then we look at this 1 over x squared and we think, ah, that's going to be the natural log of the absolute value of x squared, right? <sighs> Wrong. Don't get carried away with this ln thing. Just because you have a 1 over form doesn't mean you always have natural log. This is not going to be correct. And you want to be really careful. You want to resist the temptation to do that. The AP exam threw a problem like that at students Oh couple of three years ago, and it did kind of bother them. What you want to do is think of this as just x to the negative 2, and he integrates pretty nicely, right? Add 1 to the exponent, that would cause this to be negative 1, divide that by that exponent, negative 1, and there it is. You could write that as negative 1 over x if you prefer. And then, of course, we'll put our plus C. So you got to be very careful about even some of the more subtle integration techniques. Next up, we are going to use our good friend, the initial condition. That's the point 1, 3. This point, we know, lies on this equation to this curve. So we know that we can use it inside the equation anytime we want. Uh, and it's going to help us in this instance to find C. Let's see how bad C is. Sometimes C's are kind of ugly in this case. So natural log of 3 is what we get on the left. Negative 1 divided by 1. Well, of course, that's just negative 1. And so when we add 1 over to the other side, C's, well, it's not the prettiest thing in the world. 1 plus natural log of 3, we'll just have to deal with it. All right, so now we're going to go back to our previous version of our equation, and we're going to replace the C with the value that we found, plus 1 plus ln of 3 in this case. Now, whenever it is feasible, we are obligated to solve for y, and we want to do that in this case. This is a problem that can be solved for y. If you remember in example four, we had a pretty tough one that we had to just kind of wave the white flag and leave it as it was without y being isolated. So to do this, we're going to do our typical exponentiation of both sides. Use a base of e and just write each side as an exponent. That exponent on the right side is pretty robust, as you can see. 
the E and the LN will basically annihilate one another and leave us behind the argument of the natural log. We've talked about this a little bit, but again, because this Y right here is a positive number, we don't have to worry about taking uh, the absolute values into consideration. We don't need to worry about this right side here being uh, the minus version of the absolute value because we have this positive. So that's a little bit nice. And on the right side, well, hmm, I guess we could do a little bit of simplifying if we wanted to. There's a lot of ways that we could write this. Um, trying to think, hmm, what's the best approach? Maybe splitting it up at the second plus sign. Now, why do I split it up at the second plus sign? Well, I noticed that if I could isolate the E to a power with an LN, those two things would annihilate each other, and then a three would come out to the front like this. And then I have my E, and then really what you want to do here is kind of up to you. I would be perfectly content with a solution like that. Uh, otherwise, you could combine uh, and get a common denominator of x, and you would have essentially negative 1 plus x, or maybe x minus 1. And you know what? I'd like to scooch that a little bit farther. Well, that's not going to let me do it. I want that to look like an exponent, everyone. So let's just make it happen here. x minus 1 all over x could be that exponent, and that's perfectly fine. Now, it says to state the domain of your solution equation. Well, I just want to make sure that we understand that there could be some x's that just are no-no here, that we're not allowed to have. And seeing as how you have an x that's in that denominator, it's not a bad idea to state, oh, wait a minute, this is probably not going to work really well if I have an x that's equal to zero. So let's safeguard against that, let's say. Now, I wonder, could there possibly be maybe some other restrictions? Well, let's jump over to the graphing calculator and take another look at the solution of this differential equation. So once again, welcome to our graphing calculator here. We are using the TI Inspire CX2 for this demonstration. And we're going to go into our graph entry, and we want to choose differential equation. That would be this option 8. Recall that we did this a couple of videos ago where we have a y1 prime. So we have to make sure that when we enter our differential equation y over x squared that we follow the protocol and use a 1 along with our y and then divide by x squared and boom that's going to work beautifully as our differential equation and then down here 1 comma 3 is where we can insert our nice little point and I'm going to go into my parameters here just to show you a couple of things that I like to do um, the default setting for the field resolution is 14. That means you're going to get 14 little slope segments across the width of the screen. I might up that to say 20 just so that we have a few more to use. And I always like to let my plot step be just a, a bit more precise. I like to change it to 1 over 100, which means every 100th of a value in my x, the calculator is going to be uh, basically producing a, a value that's going to be on our solution curve. Those are typically the only two settings that I that I'll change. All right, well, let's go ahead and enter and see what we've got here. Boom, there it is. There's our graph that meanders through those slope segments. There's the ordered pair 1, 3. And we see that this graph looks like it, well, what does it do? It looks like it only goes here to about the origin, and we don't see anything over here. Now I'm going to try a couple of things just to experiment. I'm kind of wondering what is it that we're going to see maybe if we zoomed in here a few times. Because if you remember, we thought our domain restriction was going to be such that x can't be 0. 
Well, if we zoom in a few times, and I think we're going to start losing our resolution. As you can see, yeah, that's not so fun, right? You get these dots that are separated because we're now zooming in tighter than the 0.01 between each of our dots that we were going to compute. But what's going to happen is that you're not going to really be able to benefit from the fact that there's this open circle right here. We know that x can't be 0 in our differential equation solution. The graph will have a difficult time putting that open circle there, unfortunately. Now, let's try something else. I'm going to zoom back to normal, zoom standard. Why do we not have anything over here? Because that's making me think that our domain restriction might be a bit different. So I am going to hit tab to reopen my graph entry and what if we decided to maybe move our initial condition instead of making it 1 3 how about if we made it negative 1 3 what effect does that have well that moves it to the other side of the y-axis as you can see it's going to remain on that side and it seems as if this y-axis might be serving as an asymptote or something close to the y-axis might be a better way to to uh, describe that. Well, it looks as if one side doesn't want to have anything to do with the other and vice versa. So what that means, if I return one last time to our problem, I think that we should reach uh, think our domain and say that this is only allowable for x greater than zero. Let's return to the document. So as we said, it may be in our best interest to denote that as our final answer. Now, how would we have figured that out without graphing? Well, that's a great question. Maybe something that we can address in another video. For right now, it really doesn't bother me that we had to use the technology to see that. It's very possible that maybe a domain restriction in a problem like this won't even be addressed, and you could leave the answer as such, and we would uh, leave the domain sort of by the wayside. But I wanted to bring up the point that sometimes we can get these fairly unpredictable predictable domain restrictions that might require us to investigate a little bit further. My point in this video was to make sure that you all felt very comfortable with the separation, the fact that our differential equation was expressed just a bit differently, and we had the same kind of attitude about trying to find our value of C and moving on to our solution equation. This will take care of our a wide array of problems that we've done in topic 7.6 and 7.7. .7. We invite you to tune into our 7.8, which we're going to talk about all of the various exponential models with differential equations. We have quite a few real life examples. Some of them you might find kind of interesting. If you like the video, please subscribe, hit the thumbs up if you like, and please continue to join us in the future. Thanks, and we'll see you next.